All right. Bueno, buenos días. I'm going to transfer over to English now. So, ¿Cómo estuvo esa primera presentación? Last thing in Spanish. How was that first presentation? Any you guys were here? Yeah? Good? Good, good. All right. So, our next guest has roughly 15 years worth experience in the video game industry as an executive producer and a producer. Um, he also uh, works, oh, he's got a, got a couple of things here. <laughs> so, and he's going to talk to us about a little bit here and there bits of experience he's picked up in those 15 years along the way as far as game publishing goes. So as the title says, game publishing from start to finish, I'm going to leave you guys, give him a warm applause. <laughs> Patrick Kelly.
for the Marvel movies, I see the people like uh, that I worked with are still there. So, yeah. Um, and then I worked after that. Uh, I went to work for Lucas, and I worked on um, the Indiana Jones game and the Force Unleashed and some of those games. Um, after and I worked with ILM, and we did a lot of stuff with ILM, and and um, that was fun. There's a and just uh, so you know, there's a huge difference, and, and this is something that you don't realize, is there, there's a difference between making video games and making movies, and I know some of you are familiar with that, but interesting thing is that when you're an artist who makes uh, movies, you're actually part of a union, and when you're an artist who makes video games, you're not part of a union. So it's funny because we have people who do the same thing, and they sit in two different buildings, but there's rules. And so there's all these rules on like having ILM work with LucasArts and, and stuff like that. It's really interesting. After LucasArts, I went to work for Namco Bandai. And that was my first time. Uh, the reason I wanted to go and I was really interested in Namco was because it was a Japanese company. And I never worked in a Japanese environment before. And it was really interesting, the Japanese business model. And there's a lot of things that uh, as an American, I didn't understand and I didn't know. And I have a lot of funny stories about making a lot of mistakes working with the Japanese. Because as an American, you know, you slap people on the back and stuff like that. If you, you, don't, you don't do that to the Japanese. Yeah, the first time the Japanese executives came through, I made some joke and slapped them on the back. And everybody was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then I sent an email, I'm so sorry. And he said, you're American, don't worry about it. I said, oh. I said, oh. thank God. <laughs> so after Namco, I went to, and this is uh, 15 years, so I'm breezing through it. I went to work for a company called Ignition, and that was a startup. So I kind of came full circle. I went from, um, this was a big company, but we were kind of a satellite. So I went from small to huge to then medium, and then back down to small. So and lately, I've been doing a lot of lecturing and teaching and things like that. So that is my, uh, that's my background. Thank you. <laughs> yes, somebody already has a question. What game did you work on? Worked on. Um, we were we partnered with a um, with EA to work on Hellgate London, which was an MMO style game, and then um, I also helped with the uh, the team working on Afro Samurai and um, Slaughterhouse. I think is the, the yeah. yeah. So, yep. Yeah, a lot of a lot of fun. Oh, another question already. Well, interestingly enough, I'm um, by nature, I'm kind of a, a homebody. I like to stay at home and play video games, of course, and watch TV and watch movies and everything. So I made, I made a conscious effort that in order to be successful, I was going to have to push myself way outside of my comfort zone. So that's why I took a lot of the chances, and I went from studio to studio, and um, because when you're at a studio or you're at any job for a long period of time, um, it takes a while for you to get promoted. And uh, you know, you, you either, they either create a new position or if you're lucky, your boss gets run over by a truck and you get to have his job. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the, um, if you, so if I'm working at a company and I'm a producer and I'm hoping, you know, I mean, I don't want anything bad to happen to anybody, but I want a, I want a promotion. So I could wait for one to be created, but if, if I go online and I look for jobs, chances are somebody needs like a senior producer. And so then you can climb in the ranks really quickly that way. And most places that you work at, you get like a, 
like let's say between a five and a, a 10% raise every single year. And uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's for a game company, you know, and that's doing pretty well. And cost of living is about a 3%. So take, if you get a 10% raise, you need to account for inflation. So minus three, so you get about a 7% raise. That's how uh, cost, of, cost of living works. So um, you could get, you know, you get a 7% raise or whatever when you work at a, at a studio, but if you go somewhere else, you, know, you get like ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 more. So there's, uh, there's, but there's pros and there's cons about jumping from studio to studio. I mean, I know this is a long, very long answer to your, to your question. Um, there's, uh, there's something to be said. It's exciting. It's new. Everything is like new. You get to learn new stuff. You get a promotion. You get more money. You get treated really well. Um, but then on the downside, uh, you don't have any friends. <laughs> you have to keep moving all the time. You know, there's a lot of stuff. And I can get into that more later on. So, but... Um, let me just jump in. Let me just jump into some of the stuff I have going on, and then I'll break in the middle, and we can ask some more questions. So, when you first start a game, and you have an idea for a game, you gotta you gotta start somewhere, and you gotta you have to be honest with yourself, and you have to ask yourself some really hard questions. And one of the the best places to start is you you ask yourself, what's driving my game? If I'm an artist, chances are that the art is driving my game. If I'm a coder, code, and so on and so forth, right? And so you've got a game like, um, let's say, Portal. And Portal is a game that's designed around code. It's a coder made something really cool, which was this teleportation gun. And you jump through the portals. And, and they were like, OK, we made this cool technology. So now let's figure out how to make a game out of this. Then you've got other games which are driven by art. So you got a game like um, Assassin's Creed, which is just a beautiful game, you know? And they're like, this looks awesome. Now let's figure out how to make a game out of this. <laughs> and then you've got stuff like um, that, is, uh, that is very story driven. Like, uh, let's say, you know, I'm hard, what's that? Final Fantasy, yep, that's exactly what I was thinking. Final Fantasy. So you have a story, and they're like, okay, we got this big epic story that I want to tell. How do I make a game out of that? So you figure out what it is that you're trying to, to do, and, and from what angle. And if you look at like the game Limbo, you know, Limbo was very dark, and it was a very art-driven thing. And they were like, I have this art style and this way of, of doing things, and so I want to make a game out of that. So as long as you know where you're coming from and you know what's driving the game, then you'll be, that's a really good place to start. And I put audio down by itself because even if you have an audio-based game, like Guitar Hero or something like that, it's still um, based on mechanics. So audio, honestly, is the icing on the cake. Audio, anybody who's in, a, in audio, I don't know if there's any audio people in here, but uh, audio is really super like layered system, and that makes everything so much better. But you can't really have a game focused on just the audio. That's very hard to do. So usually you end up with art, code, or story. So the next step is once you have, you know what you're doing, you know what kind of game you want to make, and you've got this idea. You want to create a, what's what called a one page, or they'll say like your elevator pitch. Some of you guys might have heard that already. And so you'll have your ele elevator pitch, and you say like, so what is this game about? And you want to list off the top three mechanics. You know, if we're talking about, say, Mario or something like that, one of the, the top mechanics are um, the jumping, of course, the running, and like, you know, the obstacle avoidance. So those are the top three mechanics for something like that. So you want to figure out, and this is also called, this can help, and I'll get back to this a little later, which is called your razor statement. And um, 
once you figure out what it is you're trying to make and the top three mechanics, three to five, that you want to do, what's this game most similar to? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with everybody wants to try to make a new, unique game, and they really loathe to say, uh, it's like uh, GTA, only it's going to be a cartoon. You know, then that makes you feel like uh, nobody's going to take me seriously because I'm basically just ripping off GTA. But there's nothing wrong with setting the image in people's mind so they know where you're going, right? Like uh, I've joked around quite a few times that say if I, I could try to spend all afternoon trying to tell you about this concept I have, right? But if I say, okay, it's like Indiana Jones, but you're a chick and you have guns. And it's like, that's Tomb Raider, right? And it's like, now, now everybody knows what I'm talking about. And I'm like, okay, now that everybody knows, now let's start talking about some stuff. And there's nothing wrong with doing that because then you don't have to spend an hour trying to tell everybody what, the, what it is. You just tell everybody what the differences are. Difference between Tomb Raider and Indiana Jones are these four things, right? So what's the age range? That's an important thing and that's often overlooked. It's like, what age are you going for? Who's, who's gonna be playing your game? What's your, you know, you'll hear the word demographic. What's your demographic? Are you going for kids? Are you going for teenagers? Are you going for college age people? Like who are you going for? And then what type of game is it? Is it a platformer? Is it a shooter? Um, is it a puzzle based game? Like these are all questions you have to ask yourself. What's the mood of the game? Is it a funny game? Is it a dark game? Is it, uh, you know, you have dark humor? Like there's all these different things. And these will feed into your razor statement which, like I promised, I'll tell you a little bit more about. And then what's the overall goal of the game? Like, what, what experience do you want to convey to the audience? What do you want them to walk away with? You want them to be like, you know, I want to scare the crap out of them? <laughs> or I want them to have a really fun time? I want them to beat up their friends? Like, what is it that you want them to do, right? And then you go... You go, yeah, Mario Party. You know, it's like <laughs> I, you can beat up on your friends without getting in trouble. <laughs> and yeah, and wreck your relationships. <laughs> kind of like Monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So once you have some of those questions in your mind, you want to you wanna create what's called a deck. And a deck is basically just like a PowerPoint presentation that goes over a very high level of what your game is going to be about. And uh, they call it, I think they call it a deck because it's just like a deck of cards. You just like, you print it out and you have a, and then you, it's funny because you make a PowerPoint presentation but then the executives still make you print it out so they can follow along. And they're like, oh, okay. And then they can look ahead when they get bored, you know. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So basically, it's technically a strategy system. Yes. Yes, exactly. This whole thing is to help you organize your ideas, get your ideas together in a cohesive way that you can then share them with other people. And when you go through this process, it also helps like point out things to you. It makes you go through this kind of routine or this uh, series of steps and you're like, oh, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. Because sometimes you, you have an idea but you ha don't, don't understand the whole world. So I created a, a small little game um, for you guys, to, you know, uh, to, to show you how I would go about doing it if I were to do it. Very simple. So <laughs> my name is called, my, my game is called Birdshot. And the whole point of Birdshot is you are a bird. Like, I'll, well, I'll, let me get right into it. You're a bird. And you're Birdie McFeathers, and you fly around, and your job is to crap on people. <laughs> so you, you fly around, and you drop bombs on people, psh, boom, and you hit them. And, the, and then the more, the, the better the target, the more points you get. So the whole point of this is to time and release your, your bombs. So they, f they drop down, and they hit stuff. 
And uh, you know, you've got all these different mechanics that work into that. It's a mobile game, and you play on your phone. So you swipe left and right to, to make your bomb go where you want it to go. <laughs> so here's Aguanten las preguntas para después de la charla ahorita, por favor. Gracias. So here's a kind of a concept piece that I put together. And you'll be flying over the city. And then you'll, uh, you know, you'll release a bomb. And it'll go flying down. And you'll have to go in between swiping left and right. You'll have to go in between these buildings and then aim for something. And then pick your target. As you fly down, you get closer and closer. And you got to decide, are you going to go for the car? Are you going to go for a person? Are you going to go for a food truck? Are you going to try to land on the... The hot dog that somebody's eating? <laughs> Or are you going to get this guy? You get this guy, ah. So then you rack up the points. So. so if we go back, and we go back to the overview, and this is what's called a razor statement here. This has all the information about what the game is. Very simple. All the, like, everything you need to know is in this. And it's called the razor statement because it helps you cut through, helps you cut through all the, all the arguments. And if you say, okay, do we have to have complicated traffic in this game? Maybe not, because this isn't, that's not the point of this. The point of this is to play as the bird and to hit things and everything. So it helps you make your decisions. So a razor statement is really important, and it can, you can refer back to it. As the game gets more and more complicated, and you introduce more and more things, and you forget what you were making originally, you can go back to this, and then you can figure out what was it that we were trying to make? Oh, yeah. Because after about a year working on the game, you kind of forget what you started it on. And there was a question? Yes. Yeah, you can. Well, I'm going to have different birds. Yeah, there'll be different birds. Yeah, I've actually, um, I actually get into some of the features in a few minutes. So one of the things you, uh, you have your controls on how do you control, and I talked about it. Very simple, tapping and swiping. So this is kind of a typical pitch of what you're doing. So what you're seeing so far in all these slides with, with Birdie is uh, just a typical pitch that you're going to give to somebody. And then you want to detail some of the challenges. What are the challenges that go into this game? Well, the buildings are going to be something I have to avoid. I have to avoid airplanes. I have to uh, avoid umbrellas and potentially other birds that are going to get in my way. <laughs> and then what kind of feedback? What kind of fl player feedback is super important? So what's the player? And what, I what I'll do is I'll make this stuff available to you guys. I will give it to somebody, hopefully, and then you guys can find it somewhere and check it out and maybe use it um, if you, if you want to base you know, your own stuff on it. You can mess with this. So it's going to have all these different features. And these are going to be the main feedback features of the game. And what's my competition? So I did some research, and I saw what my competition was for this game. And uh, there's something on Android, PC, and iOS. And those are the closest games to what I have going. But you can ask, what, what does my game that have that these don't? And my game has the, the time slowing down, and it's more about going from really high to really small. And where did I draw some inspiration, or what, what do I want from my games that, that other games have? Well, I really like um, when you play Zuma, uh, the, um, the sound effects, and, this, and the music is really great in that. And then, of course, the character-driven stuff in Angry Birds is on point. You can't, you can't uh, go wrong with that. So. That is my pitch, right? <clears throat> so now that I have that, and we'll, so now that we have that as a reference point for what we're doing, um, we look at, and this is, this is what I'm, like I said, this is your razor statement. This is what your game is about. And this will help you drive all the decisions. So you want to have this, and we'll, I'll keep referring back to this. So this will make your life 10 times easier, especially if you work on a big team. 
So where do you go from there? You got your razor statement, you've got your pitch. What's the next step? Well, the next step is your priorities, right? And if you look and you say, you want to break the game up into features. What, what features do, does this game contain? All of the features, everything I can think of. And then what you want to do is you want to say, I'm going to assign those features to an A, B, and C feature. What's the core functionality? What's the cool stuff I want to do? And what's the nice to have stuff? So you start with your A features, then you move to your C features, and then you go back to B. So the reason you start with A is because A is the easiest stuff, like what's the bare minimum that I need to make this game? And then B, B or C is the entire list, right? So you've already finished A and B. And C is somewhere in the middle. So then you just decide, okay, what is like halfway between these two points that it's acceptable to make? And the A features are what's called your MVP, your minimum viable product. Your minimum viable product is, what is the smallest version, the most stripped down basic version of this that can still be considered a game? Like if everything went horribly wrong, what do I need to have to still put it out there and then be called a game? And that's what's your minimum viable product. So if you look at all the features that, were, that go into Birdshot, I could do all this stuff. This is just a list off the top of my head when I was writing this of what could possibly go into this game. And you see there's a lot of interesting things that I want to do. You know, I want to have an original soundtrack and I want to have seven playable birds and I want to have all these different cities and I want to go from city to city to do this stuff. Right? But I don't need all this stuff to make a very, very, very simple game. Like the different cities aren't needed right away. So they're not part of what's called your minimum viable product. So you take this big list that you've created, right? And you compare it against your razor statement or your game pillar. And then that helps you then take that and determine what your A, B, and your C features are. And so you can take that and you start breaking it up. You can see out of this thing back here, right? I took this, compared it to this, and then I have this. And this helps me figure out what, what I absolutely need, the most, the most basic version of the game that I could possibly have, the next step from there, and then all the extra cool stuff that could go into my game. All the really neat stuff, achievements, time trials, leaderboards, voiceovers, people get screaming when they get pooped on. Um, all these different birds, you know, um, social media integration, you know, just some really cool stuff, the original soundtrack. But I don't need that to prove that having flying a bird and dropping bombs on people is fun, right? To prove that that's fun, this is all I need, right? And so when you're, when you're designing a game and you're starting a game and you might want to look to get um, funding for it or something like that, that's what you want to have. You want to have the A set, your minimum viable product. Because then you've proved to them that it's fun. It's fun to do this. And so it's fun for people to engage in this, right? And there's more to it than just the bird. It's like, you know, it's like a fun game. My idea was that this game is something that you play while you're waiting. You're waiting in the doctor's office. You're waiting for all this stuff. You know, people are making you wait for things. And you're waiting in line. You play this game. You let off some steam. You left some steam uh, via making somebody else's day horrible. So that's, that's the point, right? You're, you feel crappy, and you're going to crap on somebody, and you're like, this is good. Right? So that's, that's the idea. And so to prove that that's fun, to let off some steam is fun, I have my A features, and I take that to somebody, and they go, wow, this is, really, this is fun. I could do this all day. And you're like, good, that's, that's what I intended to do. But to keep it from getting boring, I move into my B features. And then and that will keep you playing. And then what keeps you the overall like playing the game from start to finish is C features. 
So now that we've got our, our A, B, and C features, we're going to move on to something called your key dates. And I think this is something that will probably be the most uh, interesting to you or the most informative. And this was something that I had to develop myself over time. Nobody actually taught me this. I just learned from doing it the wrong way many, many times, right? That uh, I'm making a game, and then right in the middle, they're like, hey, you're going to go to E3. And you're like, oh, that would have been nice to know. <laughs> and I had to, um, not only did I, I don't want to brag, you know what I did? I, <laughs> I went to, I had to go to E3 a few years, and I had to present the game and everything, and, uh, and I had to do a lot of working with the press and presenting the game and playing the game and everything else. And it's stressful. It's stressful to make a game right, that's going to go to E3, then it's even worse when you're the guy who has to stand up there in front of everybody and, like, present it, and then it crashes, and you're like, oh, I, I'm, that, meant, I'm, that meant to happen. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's like a whole different level, right, because the guy who, the coder who's been working really hard to make the game, he doesn't have to stand up there in front of 100 people and the game crashes. And then you have to be like, let me tell you some jokes while we reboot the game. <laughs> so here are some of the, the most important key dates on, uh, in a game cycle. And I will go on and through these individually. But I think if you write these down or you take a picture of them or whatever, and like I said, I'll make this available to everybody, that these are, and you work these in, you can understand where you need to be at any given time. And I'll wait. I see some people writing it down. So you start, like I said, you start with your design phase. You move to your proof of concept and then prototype. And then you've got your minimum viable product in there. And then your first playable and, and so on. But you, you want to know what you're going to be responsible for. You really do when you start. How is this going to be used? Because I've had times where I was... Um, I made my first playable, and then I gave it to the publisher, and they took it somewhere, and they showed it to somebody, and uh, nobody told me that they were going to do that. And there's a lot of weird stuff when you're making the game that you're like, you know, if you go right, everything looks great. If you go left, it looks awful, and the game crashes. So you're like, let's not go left. So when you start the game, so what is design phase? What is the pre-production? You might have heard design phase, pre-production, all that stuff. So pre-production is where you come up with all your ideas. You create your GDD, which is your game design document, your TDD, your technical design document. That's where the coders go in and say how they're going to make stuff and how they plan to do everything. Your VDD, which is your visual design doc. So basically, designers, coders, artists, they all have their master document, right? And then the producer, like me, goes in and makes the boring schedule stuff. And then you have, so then once you've got that, you've got the, the, the next phase, which is the proof of concept. And the proof of concept is you take all your, all those features. Remember how I said you have between three and five features? You have that, you have those and you, and you put them in a sandbox all by itself. And you say, like, prove that each feature is fun all by itself before you go and you add them all together. So all the ingredients are tasty all by themselves. When I was working on Indiana Jones, um, we were working on the combat system. And I said, we well, need to isolate just the combat. I just want Indiana Jones and two Nazis, and I want it and when we can make it fun to just beat the crap out of, out of uh, zombies, out of Nazis in a room all by itself, then when we add in all the other stuff, it'll be even more fun, right? But it has to be fun to beat the crap out of Nazis. And we were lucky because it is always fun to beat the crap out of uh, Nazis, you know? <laughs> it's one of those things where you don't have to, you don't have to, it's not too much of a leap, right? Why am I beating the crap out of him? Well, look how he's dressed. He deserves it, right? And I've learned over time that there's certain people 
where there's certain classes you can introduce into a video game that makes it very easy for people to understand why they're shooting at these people. And you don't even have to explain, you know? I, I just put them in a Nazi uniform and I already know why I'm supposed to be shooting at them, right? If they're a zombie, I know why I'm supposed to be shooting at them, right? If they're a zombie Nazi, like then, then it's all, you can do whatever you want and I don't even have to explain why. The, yeah, the whole game could be about driving over zombie Nazis with the tank, and you'd be like, oh, I'm cool with that. And you don't even have to explain why you're doing it. You're doing it because they're zombie Nazis. That's why. So your proof of concept, sorry, I got sidetracked. I like the <laughs> zombie Nazis. Um, so what is your proof of concept? Your proof of concept is to have all these little satellites. So you guys are familiar with... Um, uh, like Unreal and then uh, Unity and stuff like that. And so you're, you're familiar with like scene, having different scene files and things like that, right? So what you want to have is each one of those scene files represents a little sandbox. And like in one sandbox, you know, I would have, if I went back to the Indiana Jones thing, I'd have Indiana Jones beating the crap out of people. And then another one, Indiana Jones driving a car. And then another one, him using the whip. Right? And so I have all these different things, and I prove that it's fun to use the whip, to pull things down with the whip, to just whip the whip people. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I shout, no, Nazis, not people, Nazis. <laughs> yeah. So using the whip, or driving the car, or fighting on a car, on a moving platform. So I do all these things separately, but I don't put them together because I don't want to complicate it. I want to see if they're fun by themselves, and then I also want to see, like, I don't want to have anything break anybody else's stuff, basically. Because that's what we're going to do in the prototype. So you take everybody's stuff and you jam it all together and everything breaks. And so that's what the prototype is. You jam everything together and you try to get it, all the proof of concepts to work in one Big file, all together, and play nice together. Sorry, question? Yes, uh, when you were talking about the scenes, the different scenes, would that, would that be like developing all four and five that in different mechanics, but on different scenes? Yes, like all by themselves. Or, oh, no. Just basically, if um, I'm working on, if I'm working on using the whip, and you're working on uh, melee punching, and beating people up, I can work on it in my own little thing without it interacting with yours at all. So if you change something, I don't come running over to your desk and go, ah, you broke my stuff. Like, because there's plenty of time for that. <laughs> That's where that happens, right? So this is the time when you can work on stuff without worrying about breaking anybody's stuff. You can try anything you want, and it uh, it's free. It's a free time for you to just make it as fun as humanly possible without worrying about it. Because then later on, you have dependencies where you can't change stuff for fear of breaking somebody else's work. And you guys might have some exposure to that working in teams already. So then you have the next phase, which is your minimum viable product. And we talked about that. What's the smallest stripped down version you can have that's still called a game? After your minimum viable product, you have what's called a first playable. And your first playable is really the first time the game comes together and you can play it uh, from start to finish. But not the, not the entire thing. It's the first time you can get a really good feeling of the experience of this whole thing. So it's not the whole game. It's not even a, it's not even a giant part of the game. It's just this one little experience that says, okay, what's it going to feel like to play this game? And you stitch a lot of things together. So all the menus work, all the, the sound effects are working, the combat's working, all these different things. It's like, it's all rough, but it's working. It's not until later on that, and you'll see later on, that you start to create like a, a really, a demo. Demos are later. This is just your first playable that shows all the different facets, the UI, the HUD, 
all that stuff in their first pass. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, the whole idea as a whole, like all the stuff stitched together. And, and also, like you can go from level one to level two. So like in, in the POCs, the proof of concepts, it's just punching. And then, in the, and then in the next phase, in your prototyping phase, it's punching works with the whip and all this stuff. By the time you get down to first playable, you have a uh, main menu. And then you can load the game, you can launch the game, you can save the game, the HUD works, you can beat people up, you can use the whip, you can do all these different things. Uh, you can finish the level, then you can go into the next level, and uh, you can actually get some game progression going in this thing. <coughs> and then from there, full production begins. Basically, all of this times 10. That's when that starts. Like Then it's just like, You've got a valve and the and the water's on like a trickle, and then you just turn it on full blast. That's basically what happens there. Okay, and then you've got what's called a vertical slice. And I don't know if you guys have heard about vertical slice. You might have read it in postmortems and stuff like that. Vertical slice is something that comes later on that is it's called a vertical slice because it's like when you drill down into the ground and then you pull up a big section, and the ground in that section will tell you what all the layers of the ground looks like. And it's a good sample of like what it looks like, whether I'm standing here or over there or over there, there's gonna be sand, then there's gonna be clay, and then there's gonna be gravel, and there's gonna be all these things. So that's what your game is. Imagine your game is just a big patch of ground, and you drill a hole in it, and then you pull out a section, and you go, this is what it's gonna be like. So your vertical slice is a slice down the whole middle of your game that shows you what gameplay is going to be, what the whole experience is going to be. And you're going to stitch a whole bunch of things together. And I say badly because nothing. you're only like halfway done with the game at this point. right? So you're going to say, OK, we have level 1, 7, and 12 and a half done. So let's make a game out of that. And um, and so, how do you make a game out of that? Like, well, you're gonna have to stitch that together and try to find some cohesive way of making that feel like it's an actual experience. So then you'll you'll probably have a little throwaway work in there, right? You're gonna have areas because because like level three doesn't normally connect to level seven. You got to figure out a way to make it seem like that's what you intended to do to give it a nice feeling. So if they didn't know any better, if you said, like, um, there's going to be 40 more hours of this, you could be like, OK, now I, f I know what it's like. Because here's a beginning level, a middle level, and an end level to the game. Sorry, question over there, right? Is there any questions? No? OK. Um, and then once you have your vertical slice, you take that vertical slice, and that's where you begin testing it. And testing is a broad term that's used for lots of different things. QA is testing. Those are the guys who get paid like you know, 10 bucks an hour to, to play your game over and over and over and over again. And bugs, yep. And then they do all these horrible things to break your game on purpose. And then every morning you have this big bug report sent in, and you're like, why would you even do that? And <laughs> like, they're like, hey, if you are playing the game, and you reach out, and you grab, and you rip it out of the console, while if you pull the disc out while the game is playing, it crashes. And you're like, of course it does. <laughs> why would you do that? Yeah, but they do. And, um, and they find all these weird things, because they do all these horrible things that they're not supposed to be doing. You know? Sometimes they'll even, like, uh, they'll even turn the controller, and they'll like, balance something against it and just let it go by itself for like 12 hours. And they're like, it breaks when you balance a water bottle on the controller for 12 hours. And it's really, it can be really frustrating. But they do find some really interesting bugs. Really, because once it goes out to the public, 
And there's millions of people. There's going to be some dude who, like, bounces a water bottle on the damn game and <laughs> stops working. Yeah, every, and that's why everybody's opening it now to like beta testing and let beta testing now allows the public to play it because instead of 10 guys trying to break the game, I now have a million people trying to break the game. And they're, and they're having fun. It's so. the public is much more mm -hmm. Yeah, you have a million people testing it. You're going to find all the bugs really fast. And and they're enjoying it. It's like the it's the it's the smartest thing the game industry ever did. Like get free labor. Yep. Yes. Yes. You can play the game and, and figure out what's wrong with it. And the cool thing is, you can actually have some kind of influence on what the final product is. So it's really a win-win for everybody involved. It's it's really a brilliant thing that they do. Yeah. Yeah. Don't even get me started on that. People are like, I I joined the early beta, and I'm like, why would you want to play some broken crap? I don't <laughs> I don't understand. But that's because I make games, right? I make games, and I see broken games all day long. And somebody's like, I paid fifty dollars to play somebody else's broken game. I'm like, that's crazy. Early access. I'm like, hell no. I, w <laughs> I don't have enough time. I play my own broken, crappy game all day long. Why am I going to play somebody else's broken, crappy game? I don't understand. But I suppose if you're not doing it all day long, right, then it's probably uh, a good thing. And I have a story about that that I could tell you about having kind of like post-traumatic stress disorder playing a broken game for nine months. Like, yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, but I'll get to that later. Remind me. One of you guys remind me about how I can't uh, play Xbox games on the original Xbox anymore. <laughs> so where do you move from there? So if you've got your external landmarks, sorry, your testing begins and everything, and then you get your external landmarks. And all this stuff, the beauty of this is if you plan it, and this is why having that key dates document works so well, because this vertical slice can be given to the testers, the guys who break the game, the guys who try to make it so uh, this is all the button clicks and make it UX as usability. And usability, the difference between this is they tried to break the game, these guys try to make it s the experience smoother. So if it takes you 15 button clicks to get into the saved game, that's too many. And they'll tell you, like, hey, you need to slim this down and make it smoother because people are getting frustrated. Marketing is, you've probably all been somewhere where they're like, hey, you want to take a survey? And then they, you know, and then you try, and then if you pass the survey, then they'll show you a product. And then they're like, hey, taste this. What do you think? And uh, so that's what the games kind of are, where it's like you take a survey and then they bring people in that are in that demographic, kids, you know, age 14 or whatever, and, um, and, then they, and then they test those games and you see how the kids interact with it and everything else, right? So that's what QA, breaking the game, trying to make the game smoother, and then seeing what the public thinks of the game. Yes. Yeah. Actually, they work on the updates too. Yes. That's Yes. Their their job is to help you make the game better, just in general, and uh, they make things. And then you. That's why when the testing begins, you're sending them updates once a week. You're sending these people updates. They start with this, and then they tell you um, that it's really hard to see those buttons or stuff you didn't even think about, where they're like. Um, these colors don't work. If you're colorblind, you won't be able to see which button you're supposed to hit. And you're like, oh, I didn't think of that because I'm not colorblind. <laughs> so, um, or you're like, uh, it'll make you give you seizures. So you, you change that stuff. So then you can take, the cool thing is you can take these vertical slice and then you apply some of the testing and the fixing and just making everything run smoother. And then you can take those things to E3 or GDC or Comic-Con, those are your demos. Or you can put it out there for everybody to look at. You go to a random store and you say, hey, you want to play my new 
Yeah, you. <laughs> I've actually. I remember when I <laughs> when I went to. Um, I'm going to get off on a tangent again. So. I've. Uh, I went in. You'll you'll all experience this. One of the first times my game ever was on a shelf, I went into Best Buy, and I was like, I'm going to see how my game's doing, right? And I see these two kids in there. They've got these game, and they've got my game, and they've got somebody else's game. And they're going, which one should I get? And the friend goes, I heard this one wasn't any good. That was my game, right? <laughs> and he goes, you should get this other one. And he goes to put my game back. And then I walk by, and I go, your friend's stupid. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I was like, don't listen to him. He'll get you in trouble. That other game's much better, trust me. <laughs> I was like lurking in Best Buy. Who's got my? And then uh, that was like the highlight, right? And then the worst, the worst day ever was the day that I went through Best Buy again, and I saw my game in that bin with like all the stickers on it, and it's like four dollars. And I wanted to like kick over the display and be like, ah! So now I like, don't go. I don't even look at the games anymore when I go in there. It's just it's like it's too much. Too much, yeah, too much. So I don't even, and I don't read, and this is something you'll have to get used to. I don't read the reviews or anything like that because it's just too hard. It's like too difficult. You spend so much time doing this stuff. So hopefully somebody is reading the reviews and it's not me, right? <laughs> that's, that's all I care about. So then you have some traditional dates, which is like your alpha, your beta, and your gold. And we all kind of know what these things are. Um, each company has a different definition of what an alpha, a beta, and a gold is. But traditionally, you want like all your bugs and major bugs, your minor bugs, your major bugs, and then gold is where, you, um, where you're getting ready to ship the game. TRC and CRC, that's really specific to first party, and first party is what is Nintendo, um, Sony, and Microsoft, or what's called first party. Basically, the people who make the hardware. So like if you had still had like a Sega Genesis, right? That would be first party. They would be a first party, because you have to, the guys who make and own the hardware, the guys who can tell you whether or not you can actually put stuff on that hardware which is really interesting because you actually, you could make a game and then they could, in theory, say, ah, we changed our mind, you, we don't want it anymore. And then there's nothing you can do about it. So you have to involve them early on. So that's what the TRCs and the CRCs are. Those are lists of like what you need to do in order to get your game onto their hardware. Not just technically, but like the rules. You know, and everybody has rules about what you call things and how you go about stuff. And, you know, like the Nintendo rule set will be completely different than the Xbox one. Like Xbox would, would uh, allow you to have a little more violence than Nintendo will. So that'll be a, it'll be a, like a list, you know. You can have blood in there or you can't have blood in there. Or when you, you, uh, refer to the controller, it's a controller, or it's a joystick, or like rumble, or vibrate, like you have to have all these names, and they have to all be done properly. And then you do something, you do a submission for a lot check. And submission is where you send the build off to the first party guys, to Sony, to Microsoft, and they look at it, and they make sure that it doesn't crash, and it's all good, and then they uh, then they let you release it. And the interesting thing is that those guys, you give them the game, and then they print up all the discs. You don't get to like print them up yourself. They print them all up for you. They control all that stuff. And then, um, yes, one sec. And then once they, once they do that, then it goes out, and the public gets to see it. And then your ideal shelf date. So, yes. How do I how do I put that in like a feature list? You mean? Yeah, like okay, like I have my game with the you know two scores like the people got it. How do I put the time like oh it's scored the game? Like it's meet its score. 
You would say like, you would say um, for your feature list, you would say, he's asking like, if I have certain events, certain kind of sequencing events, like, um, like almost like Guitar Hero or anything where I have to hit keys at certain times, how do I put that into the feature list? And that could be done as like a sequencing thing. You say like sequencing has got to work. Quick time events have to work. Like you, you basically, the interesting thing is you can just give it a name. And you know, you could be like, uh, you know, I don't know, like clouds. Clouds have to work. Like a cloud button pushing has to work. And people be like, what's cloud button pushing? And you're like, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so if you, I find that if you make up a name, you'll be much better off than if you use a name that somebody else already owns, right? So like, we're familiar with, um, like some of you guys will be familiar with the term aggro in some games, like you, you pull aggro, which means that if you're doing too much damage, the bad guys will be more apt to attack you, right? So if you've got a big loud gun and it's going off, bah, 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 all the AI will come and rush you. Right, so that has a very specific, based on all the games that do that, that has a very specific connotation. And so you're gonna inherit that. So if you use pull an aggro as a phrase, you're going to have to, and it's different than the other games that use it, you're gonna have a serious problem. But if you use button cloud pushing, people will be like, I have no idea what that is. And you're like, great, because I just made it up. So you just, you want to kind of define it and then you say this is what it's called and then you list it off somewhere else and you say this is what it does. And that's called completion criteria. So you say the, the button, the sequencing, the button sequencing, and then you say the button sequencing has to work and it has to be playable in these ways. And if you guys have heard of Scrum and you've heard of, um, you might have heard of user stories, User stories are completion criteria. User stories are a way of saying, as a user, when I encounter the game and I play the game, I should have to press this button, these buttons in this order to have a successful playthrough. And so that you would list it as completion criteria. And that you get into that when you get into the actual scrum and the actual scheduling of everything. So. We go back, so I've given you the definitions for all of this stuff, right? So you now you see how it all fits in. So from there, right? So now you have all that, and you know what, you know what you're gonna do. The next logical step for you is to create a timeline. And can I get a drink of water? Is there? So you create a timeline. And the timeline basically says, okay, I'm here today, and the game is going to ship on this day, and then I'm going to put all these lines. Basically, you're saying this, right? But you're adding dates to it. And you're just saying, like, this is when this is going to happen. And that really helps you figure out, like, wow, this is very close to this. So, you know, I only have two months in between those. That's not a lot of time. Oh, geez. Hopefully I don't electrocute myself. <laughs> all right. So you put all these, um, you know, you put all these dates in there, and you say like, what I'm going to do. And so you, this will help you figure out where everything is, and you can start to see how things are stacked up. And you're like, you know, I have this and this spaced apart, right? Which is good. But sometimes you'll see that this is too close, and you're like, eee, this is scary. It's the first time that you can kind of see it in a way that like clicks in your head. So a timeline is really helpful. So once you have your timeline, right, the next step is to take your A, B, and C features, assign them to groups. You know, you have your minimum viable product, your A's that I listed back there. Break those into A1, A2, and A3, and then you assign those to milestones in between here. So you say in the minimum viable product, we're gonna break that into three sections, and then these are the times in which we're gonna show these. 
and you usually want your milestones to be between four and six weeks apart, just in general, because I find that people, that's the way people like to work. Anything sooner, and they will be all really frustrated because they'll feel like they're having to like put on the dog and pony show every single week, and then they hate you for it. If it's anything longer than six weeks, then they start breaking stuff. <laughs> so between four and six weeks is a, good, is a good way to schedule milestones. That's these things here. So six weeks in between these ones. And what do you do to schedule? Well, basic, basic scheduling, and this is probably something that you guys are learning already, is Scrum. And you'll hear the word Scrum and the word Agile. No? No Scrum, no Scrum, no Agile. All right, so it's a way of scheduling. Let's, let's put it this way. There's many different ways of scheduling, and they're all super complicated, super boring, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, you have to go to school specifically for them, and it's not something you want to do. But Scrum is a way that people, average people, can schedule stuff without having to go to school to learn this horribly long, boring thing, right? So Scrum is puts the, the ability to schedule things in the hands of the people who are actually doing the work. So like if you guys, if I was using one of those horrible ones, like let's say it's called Waterfall is one of them, or Critical Path, if I'm using Waterfall, I'm the only guy who knows how to use it. So then I can tell you how long it takes you to do stuff because you don't know how to do it, right? So I can schedule it. If we're using Scrum and you know, you're know you doing the work, you're putting in the estimates, like you're actually using it. So Scrum is a way of scheduling and allowing the people who do the work to actually go in and help you schedule properly. Two really good programs for that. When you first start out scheduling anything, your game, you want to use Trello. Trello is really easy to understand. Um, it's like uh, having a dry erase board, and you can move things around. Once you get really good at that, there's something called Hack and Plan. And Hack and Plan is for bigger teams. So you've got something here that is, um, that's, you know, let's say for teams of like five people. And then you've got over here teams of like 15 or more people. Then you plan your milestones out. Am I going? Uh, am I going too long? Am I good? I'm good. Okay. All right. Then you want to plan your. Once you have all that, and you, the way you want to plan out your milestones is um, subdivide your tasks. Like I said, um, have buy-in from the people who are actually doing the tasks and working on it. Um, under promise, over deliver. And this is something you guys need to learn and you should probably just learn in general. You can apply this in school. Is just always, like if you are, if you're definitely gonna have these things but you think you might have these other things, don't mention the might have stuff. Because like if I, if I say, you know, tomorrow I'm gonna give you a dollar and then I uh, come in tomorrow and I give you two dollars, you're gonna be super happy. But if I come in and I say, uh, I'm definitely going to have a dollar, I probably might even have a second dollar for you. All right? And then I come in tomorrow and I'm like, sorry, here's the one dollar. You're going to be like, boo. I wanted, to, I, I wanted two. You said two. And I'm like, no, I said maybe. And you'll be like, no, you, I wanted two. I, I already have. I was going to buy ice cream cone and everything. I have that money spent already. I'm really unhappy. So you, ne you never want, because that's just human nature. If you tell them, like, maybe, they're like, that's definite. <laughs> so you always want to under-promise, over-deliver. Show up, say you're going to get $1, and I show up and I give you 2 And then you're going to be like, woo, best day ever. Completion criteria, we talked about that. That's really important. And then when you're playing, so when you're planning out a demo, you have something called a critical path, and how do you want to have, how do you want the player to play your game? What do you want to do when you, how do you want them to progress through the level? Even if it's an open world, open world still has missions, so you want to say like, what, is, what are they going to be doing for this mission? 
And like I said, I'll put this out there for you guys to get, and you guys can look at this in more detail, but I don't want to bore you too much. I'll go through this as quickly as possible. And then there's something called your beat chart, and your beat chart allows you to figure out how, like, at what point in your project are you going to, it becomes difficult. And how do I keep this going? And how do I keep it entertaining? And I have to build tension. So if you ever play, um, I think it's Left for Dead. Yep. You know, Left for Dead, you play it, and it's like insane combat, right? And then you enter a safe zone. And then insane combat, and then a safe zone, right? And that's because if you played it at that intensity level all the time without getting a break, it, you wouldn't be able to play it for one. And two, you, you would just become desensitized to it. So you have to reset the player and then bring them back in and then reset the player and bring them back in. And that's planned, that's what's called a beat chart and planning those beats and where they hit. So I have a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, final thoughts. And this is just, this is more words of advice. If you're thinking about starting up your own company or creating a game or making an indie game, um, you want to think about doing, use an engine. It's much easier. It'll be, you'll be able to get up and running real fast. You'll be able to prove things out really quickly, right? Look into buying assets. If you have people on your team, like you can hire people, but sometimes it's just as cost effective to buy some assets. And then if you buy some assets, sometimes you can hire those people that you buy the assets from to create more custom assets for you, right? So buying assets is another thing that will help you get up and running fast. Working with people over the internet is very difficult. It's called outsourcing. It's very difficult. You can't, you can never control what they're doing. You never see them face to face. So you want to try to avoid that. I know it's really interesting to have these games and you like, you put it out there on the internet and then you have like people from all over the world who want to contribute, but it's really hard to control them and, and get them to contribute and live up to what they've promised. And when you have other people depending on them, it's very dif difficult. So you're better off having like three of your friends and you all get together than you are having 50 people on the internet trying to corral all those people. Uh, get set up with your developer accounts as early as possible. That's your um, Google Play Store stuff, Steam, all that good stuff. Um, begin working on the publishing of the game three months before the game completes because it's going to take you three months to fill out all the paperwork, get all that stuff going, right? Um, iOS, Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo costs money. So, and it's very difficult to do. So, the best way to start a game, if, if you ask me, again, so this is just advice, is to use um, Android and release on Steam. And then once you take it that far, then work on the next steps. If you start and you go, you're gonna, I'm gonna make it for iOS or I'm gonna make it for Xbox, it's just so long and so difficult that you will get discouraged as you go. But if you can release it first on Steam, you're like, you feel, still feel excited and you're like, all right, now let's go for Xbox, right? But if you just go straight for Xbox, you'll be like, oh, this was awful. You know? um, figure out how you're gonna, uh, far you're gonna go with the APIs. So if you're gonna do Steam, like are you gonna incorporate all the different things, like let's, or let's say Twitch? You can do a lot of really cool stuff with Twitch right now. So you need to decide like how far you're going to go and how f if you're going to implement this and if you're going to work it into your actual design. Localization, if you guys are going to do localization, you want to start it as soon as possible. And the reason I put this in here is because we have a lot of Spanish speakers here, right? So if you're going to do Spanish and English, you should plan that sooner than later because there's a lot of stuff that goes into language switching that you don't even realize. Like a button, a button in English, sometimes the, the Spanish word is much longer, let's say, than the, than the English word. And if you don't design the button properly, 
when you try to put the Spanish word on there, it doesn't fit anymore. So there's a lot of work that needs to go in that. Start your LLC, which is your company. Start it really early. It, it only costs you like 50 bucks or 80 bucks, let's say, and you're protected. Um, be clear about the people that you're going to hire and you're going to work with. Are, they, are you going to pay them? If you're going to pay them $10 an hour or you're going to pay them 100 bucks, you own everything. If they're working for free, they might expect a stake in the game. And you want to be clear you know, what, what they should expect and, and what they're going to get out of the deal. Have people sign NDAs which is a non-disclosure agreement, which means that you know, they're not going to leave your team and start a very similar game 10 minutes after you explain to them what an awesome game Birdshot is. <laughs> um, you need to be excited about your project. So you need to be the most excited person in the room when it comes to your project. Like, I am so, this is going to be the best game ever. Because if you're not excited about it, they won't be excited about it. And if you want to try to seek outside funding for your project, like bring it to Activision or EA or something, you're going to need a prototype. Uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. You can steal stuff from other games. It's totally cool. <laughs> Everybody steals something from somebody else, right? I mean, if the, if the controller setup for GTA works, just use it. It's much easier. It's fine. Like, GTA didn't invent the mini-map, but they use it, so they stole it from somebody else who stole it from somebody else, stole it, right? Your job is to make a cool, new, interesting game. So steal all the stuff that works, and then add your new cool stuff on top of it. Nothing wrong with that. All right? Uh, don't get too caught up in the... Uh, in the story of the game, and the theme of the game, which is really easy to do if you have a m massive Final Fantasy story. You have to still make a game. Um, each feature needs to be fun all by itself. Remember that, your POC. Your critical flow, we went over that, and your beat chart. You want to try to work those things out. So these are some of the things you want to work out. So I'm going to switch it. I'm going to go. <laughs> so, and, Questions. So we had a question over here, real quick, right? No, no, no. I just oh, you're just itching your head. Oh, you're just, well, you're just, faking me out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Geez, lots of lots of people. All right, let's start. How did I get to? How did I get to find a job? Like, how did that work for me? Yeah. I'm su I'm super old compared to you guys. Like, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work the same. I took my horse and carriage down, and, and you know, I gave a guy a sheep, and he gave me a job. No, it's I looked in the paper. I looked in the paper, and I saw a job, and I circled it like you see in the movies, and then I called. What's that? Yeah, the good times. You know. So it's going to be different. It's going to—it's way different. And nobody in their right mind made video games. And I told my parents, I was like, I'm going to go interview for a game job. And they're like, that's not a real job. So times are changed. What's the game that I what, like? I worked on that I liked the best? No, what's the game that you were playing for nine months? Oh, the game that I worked on for nine months? I worked on... Uh, no, I, yeah, I may, I worked on a game called Minority Report, which was a, uh, a movie-based game, right? And that was a very, t very difficult experience. And I didn't get a day off for like nine months. I worked seven days a week, 10 hour days, and then I was like some kind of torture victim by the time I was done. Because then I, when the game ended, I went home and I was like, I had all these games that I wanted to play. And uh, I was like, I have time off. I'm going to play GTA or whatever. And I popped the game in and I started up the Xbox and it made that sound. Remember the sound the Xbox used to make? Yeah. 
I felt sick to my stomach though, as soon as I heard that because I heard that every time my game crashed, I heard that. And then that was like, imagine if I just said, like I made the word like, boo, and then I hit you with the stick really hard, right? <laughs> and then you go home and somebody goes, boo, you're going to be like, ah, ha, ah, ah. ha, right? That's, that's what happened to me. I was like, oh, God, no, make it stop. Yeah, PTSD. Yep. A game that was rushed and under pressure. Um, yeah, all games start off like with a good, really good schedule, and um, most games end up being rushed at the end, some one way or the other. Um, I will say that there's a difference. Almost every game gets rushed. There's what's called a death march, and the death march is what happened to me on that Minority Report game. And that's where the game is so horribly messed up. Something is so gone, oh, so horribly wrong. And in that case, like we didn't have the script for the game until we were almost done with the game. And that was one of the things that added to it. So um, yeah, I, I can't even begin to tell you the differences between a death march and an actual project. So how long does it take to port a game? Um, I guess it depends on what, what you're trying to, what experience you're trying to bring. If you're just trying to port it over, it doesn't take long at all because you're just trying to get it to work. But if you want to utilize any of the specific features of that console that you're porting it to, like take advantage of any of the hardware, then it's going to take a lot longer. But if you just want to get it, like I've got, um, I go. For, it's much easier to go from uh, console to PC, let's say. And uh, so if you decide you're going to port something, it's just you got to decide whether you're going to, you want people to realize it's a port, or do you want them to think like it's its, its own thing. So it could be really quick. It could take a couple of months, or it could take a year, depending on if you're going to try to make it a unique experience. Yeah, Spider-Man. I worked on Spider-Man. And the game Lord of the Rings Return of the King that you worked on? Which one is that? Sorry? Uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, the Return of the King, the last one. Was the no, I didn't, I didn't work on that one. I did work on Spider-Man, though. Was it the second one, right? Uh, Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider-Man. No, it's a, two, the movie ones. Yeah. 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 So how, how hard is it to get people to develop a game with you? Yeah. Um, it's, it, it can be really difficult, especially if you're not paying them, right? Um, but if you're enthusiastic, that's why I said you have to be excited. If you're enthusiastic and you're like, man, this is going to change the world. This is the best thing ever. People are going to get on board with you, you know? So it all has to do with your enthusiasm and your ability to sell it and get people on board. Everybody's going to love it. Exactly. Yes. What's been one of your best projects? One of the best projects, well, hmm, that's tough. Uh, it, could go, it could go either way. Uh, one of the best projects I've ever worked on, or the best team I ever worked on was probably with Treyarch, but that wasn't the best project I ever worked on. There's been other games. That's a really hard one to... That would take me all afternoon to answer that one. Guys, I'm sorry. If you can, if you can uh, we're about to wrap up. So if you can grab the the little evaluation sheet that was on your chair and fill that out before you leave. We can take one or two more questions while you guys fill out those forms. Sorry, guys, I rambled on too much. I probably should have just like opened it up from questions in the beginning. Be like, I'm Patrick Kelly. I worked at a bunch of places. You got any questions?
George Lucas. Yeah. So when I worked at these companies, did I get to meet the the kind of the people in charge of the stuff, like the the famous people or whatever? Yeah, I get to meet George Lucas. I got to meet tons of people. I got to do tons of cool stuff. Like um, it's unbelievable. Um, Yep, I met Stan Lee, I met uh, Tony Hawk when I met a whole bunch of neat... Sorry. Did I ever have to crunch? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, crunching is crappy, just in general. You eat lots of pizza. You work lots of hours, but as long as you're not crunching all the time for extended periods of time, it's, it's, it's okay. Have I ever had it be like awful? Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, I did. That's what I did on that one game. I worked crazy amount of hours. It's yeah, you end up with post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes, last. That's an interesting question. I, I'm looking at the um, the new games, and it's funny because. The new game is very similar to the game that we made after the movies, which was um, Ultimate Spider-Man. And Ultimate Spider-Man was kind of ahead of its time because you look at the, the games now, and you're like, that's the comic booky stuff that they're doing. We did that, and nobody liked it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think that people were really interested in the movie and they didn't really understand it. The comic book stuff appealed to the comic book people. And like, yes. Last question. Mm -hmm. uh, in production, I was in charge of um, a couple of different teams and our guys were... Um, working on some of the technology that they used for the physics in the game. So, thank you very much, everybody. And All I'm right, guys. I'm sorry Let's if I missed any questions. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Thanks, si pueden, por favor, antes de salir, si pueden dejar por allí la hojita de evaluación, la pueden dejar ahí encima de la silla, al lado donde está el profesor Hoyo. Muchas gracias. Y Thank a las dos much. regresamos con nuestra próxima actividad. Así que lo veremos entonces.